Uh, Tim hasn't spoken yet. Where are you, Tim? Okay, so um, about the humanism, well, like it could it could be better, but I mean, if everybody were to work together, but that's kind of hard because people, some people don't care, other people benefit from it, other pe and the people who don't, people who do benefit from it don't care about the people who don't. So, I mean, it just I don't know. And um, when I I read the pre-class, I didn't read it. I meant to say I watched the pre-class video. And I'm not gonna lie, it kind of stood out to me. Because one of them were something about Pat Robinson talking about feminists. And I just thought it was a little bit crazy. But he was he was saying it's not about equal rights, it's about socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. So I'm not gonna lie. Well, I don't know who this is, but I think he's just being a house much because that don't make no sense. Yeah. Because well, when I said that, most of the people in there were like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, it don't make no sense. He, he uh, I think he just, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it worked after 9-11. So after 9-11, there was a lot of polarization. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to also give you a little bit of a history lesson here. We could have been united, but we got divided. Um, does everybody else remember some of those readings by the preachers? Um, I know you would think that people would have come together and yeah, okay. Um, that's true. Anyway, all right. So who hasn't spoken yet? Zane. Uh, yeah, are we just talking about like the pre-class video and stuff? Well, actually the reading would be number one. <clears throat> oh, well, um, kind of like what I saw was, I don't know if, we're, if I'm on the right topic, but uh, kind of like when it came to the uh, religious leaders and like, well, I mean, you asked yesterday also, I kind of thought about like the more, you know, the more technology grows and science goes, it seems like religion seems to like keep uh, rejecting it more and more. And that question yesterday, and like you kind of showed it today that, um, or in the reading that, you know, one side is trying to, you know, uh, reject the other. Well, I think like when it comes to the religion part, like kind of saying like, it's not like, uh, you know, the universe has a creator, you know, there's no science to it. I think it's because like, they feel like it's rejecting their whole belief system. So they kind of like trying to kind of come up with, or come up with like, you know, um, answers and i think that's why the, it keeps getting rejected and stuff like that but uh that's just kind of what i thought because i remember you asked that question yesterday but that's just kind of what i saw from the video well the trouble is um you know the preachers condemned the episcopalians and the methodists those were the people who signed the declaration of independence right right so in the name of being conservatives and patriotic so, I mean, my main point is that we're losing our tradition. It's gotten rewritten into something exactly the opposite of what it was. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's number one. And number two, if you really think people are all that wicked and have to believe, you're not gonna have a democracy because in order to have a democracy, you have to believe people can be rational and that you don't have to, uh, you know, agree with a certain religious orthodoxy. You can just come into a town hall meeting and solve a problem. You don't have to bring in religion. You shouldn't bring it in. So you're perfectly capable of reasoning without going there, right? Right, right. And so our democracy depends on that. Um, and so do enough, uh, do you think enough Americans believe that human beings are capable of solving their problems and reasoning? And do you think enough of them actually do it? 
that we can save our democracy. Yeah, go ahead, Alexis. It's, I don't have a comment on what you just said, but what you said before that made me think. So I don't know if it's true or not, but I saw an article and it was talking about our Supreme Court system and our justice system trying to combine the church and the like justice system. And isn't that what we're trying to prevent and what? Okay, so, and they do appeal to the founding fathers or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, um, but there, but over time, as we did get more and more citizens who came from more and more different religious traditions, and many of them were atheists, agnostic. I mean, we didn't deny them citizenship. Do you think you should tell anybody who's not a Christian that they can't vote anymore, that they have to lose their citizenship? That's ridiculous. Okay, well, if that's true, then we can't go back to the founding fathers, right? And um, so, so that over time through the case system, um, the laws got more and more liberal, in other words, more and more inclusive. And there were, like you couldn't, the government would not fund religious schools, for example. And now they're allowing for funding for religious schools that they didn't used to allow, right? That's part of it. Um, Hobby Lobby had a case where they wouldn't, um, you couldn't, their healthcare policy didn't allow women to have birth control because they, it, they don't believe in it because they're a religious employer. And uh, the Supreme Court said that was okay. And that was pretty radically uniting church and state. Because usually, you know, you have your religion, but when you're running a company, you can't discriminate on the basis of religion, right? But they were. So that's another example. There's other examples. Um, and so that's kind of what they're getting at. But the appeal is, well, we're appealing to the founding fathers. And I want you to think about this, that our founders on the one hand were Christian, but they were way out there Christian, right? And they never ever would have said they're not Christian or they would have not gotten reelected or nobody would have signed up for the, revolution right i mean they had to have a public identity as christian <laughs> but they were very very tolerant and they brought in people who belong to at virtue clubs right the, the club promoted virtue without any association with religion they had these humanist clubs they liked confucius analect they allowed in Quakers, they allowed in all these sects, you know, and so they were sending the message that they were inclusive. And so since then, a number of people who are obviously atheist, uh, Hindu, Buddhist, have been given citizenship. Now, do you think our founders would be outraged that they got citizenship? Or do you think, no, that's the humanistic side of our founders. In their heart, they were humanists because democracy depends upon humanist, right? Humanism, the capacity of people to govern themselves. And so, you know, that's, that's the argument. Um, I think that uh, there's like a lot of emphasis on the democratic part of the United States, but it's a republic democrat society. So it takes in mind the minority. I think that's an important part that keeps getting okay. left out okay. in like more modern conversations because like church and state, the majority is Christian and now we're not looking at the uh, minority anymore, which is a lot of other religions. Yeah, okay, that works. Protecting minority, protecting minorities. Um, 
Well, we also don't vote by lot. I mean, you can go, we have representative democracy and things like that. So um, what I'm thinking of mostly is that people participate in public life. Not every position is elected. Some of them are appointed. Um, so we have a complicated uh, system, but that's true. You protect minorities too. Um, all right. So let's just, I'll, I'll go over some of it and then I'll stop again and ask you to comment. Um, let me do this one first. All right. Oh, actually, I wanted you to comment. Each of you make two comments about the difference between the 1933 manifesto and the 1973 manifesto. And I guess I summarize those over here. So what was your impression between the 1933 one? Let's see, where is it? Here it is. And the 1973. So what did you think? This is 1933. And so it does emphasize religion and it even rejects deism, theism and modernism and other kinds of quote unquote new thought. All right. So this is sort of a statement of what was radically liberal or progressive in 1933, okay? Um, it's tolerant. It is humanistic. Um, it doesn't believe in a in a creator, like that the universe is self-existing, but they're still religious. You got to get that. Um, humans evolved, uh, and there's no dualism between nature and humanity. And religious culture is the product of social evolution. Um, it rejects supernatural guarantees of human values. All right. Um, all right. So that's 1933. Anybody have a reaction to that in terms of how progressive it was in 1933? Did you say that like it, there was a, a big, like uh, a big religious component still? What? Um, did you say that there was a big religious component still? Well, they still talk about religious humanism, right? Yeah, they they did. Um, but when I was reading it, and one of like my other points was like the uh, the um, base. Uh, so okay, underneath no, it's it's in the 1933 version. They talk about how they say religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Um, which I thought was like one of the first big like splits between probably what a lot of other people at the time were thinking. I felt like that was probably where a lot of the divide came from um, and probably where a lot of people started believing that humanism as a whole was um, not the, religious at all. Yeah, not religious, yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anybody else want to chime in? I mean, I kind of want to talk about the 1973 one. Okay, okay. Um, I'm looking for the brief outline. Okay, so I'm pretty much talking about technology. Yes. Um, I, it's such a weird concept because this was after the Second World War. The First World War already happened for the first Humanist Manifesto, but they didn't really like talk about it as much or like really at all and just kind of like there's still chemical warfare in the first one mm -hmm. that led to long-lasting effects but you could tell that they didn't care about that and they just kind of overlooked it until millions upon millions of people die in like seconds from a bomb Okay, so so what did that, what sort of mindset change do you think 
happened or needed to happen after we had this realization. So in the enlightenment, they thought everything was going to get better and better. So World War I was a big wake up call about that science and technology aren't necessarily always going to be good, right? Yeah, I, I think it just kind of pushed it to how far that we've grown in 20 years at that point, like really, and this should have started the Cold War. Did the Cold War start in the mid 70s or the early 80s? Um, actually, it started um, after World War II, So five. 1945 so this would have shown like the a little bit of the cold war as well and like how everyone's getting the world shrinking in comparison to what it was the massive network that it was and now it's just a phone call or a remote missile at that point so what they're thinking and it's coming to realization that it pretty much is like a missile that can reach almost anywhere around the world now. Right. So do you think we still believe technology will save us or do you think we're aware that it has capacity for good or evil or? I think that we know it has a possibility for good or evil. I think we also believe that it will save us too be like I like I know that's a weird thing to say but we've all kind of came to like a neutral respect that nuclear weapons are bad and if we go and do another nuclear war it will kill pretty much kill off the entire world except what about for just environmental stuff I the earth like they want to fix the environment but if one country changes the regulation it doesn't mean anything it would have to be on a global scale and like actual have everyone reporting true values instead of what they want to report so but in 1973 people were aware of it they were actually aware of it way before that too but that's when it started becoming public we have to stop this right so that was a long time ago and we didn't stop it. So you will have to figure out what to do. It will be a big issue for you. Um, what, okay, so what do you think uh, apocalyptic prophecies and doomsday scenarios are getting to be more common or will get to be more common in your lifetime as these climate change becomes a big issue. Um, and then, all right, so, and then what is the solution? Is the solution more prayer or more science or um, a combination of reason and compassion? I mean, where do you think we should go? Um, this one doesn't have to put religion front and center so much, right? Religion can, aspire, you know, move people toward high ideals, but there's also authoritarian religion that rejects science, and that makes it even worse. We need a new view of religion. Uh, promises of salvation are, are harmful because we're not going to solve our problems. And then they, by then they had this problem between capitalism and communism, so they didn't take a position on economic systems, right? Which means basically they're in the middle ground. They probably accept regulated capitalism. Um, okay, so then they, again, they're trying to deal with religious humanism, but you know, whatever you might think about the religion, the point is human flourishing. So we have to change our attitudes. Um, we have to face the crisis in terms of knowledge. So they keep constantly saying, okay, religion, fine, except that let's focus on knowledge and then let's make sure and condemn materialism, acquisition, the focus on profits. 
Um, all right, so my question is, um, can you see the difference between 1933 and 1973? Or can you, what is it from 1973 that you think is still an issue today or has gotten even worse and worse from 1973, okay? So, oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, this is what I wanted to do. All right, Michael, go ahead. Um, so I was going to say that I feel like, um, like the second uh, manifesto, we definitely get the feeling of like uh, uneasiness, um, like just for the stability of people, uh, which is something that we talked about, like with 9-11, like post 9-11, people realized that, hey, like we were susceptible to terrorist attacks. And I kind of feel like we see that shift between the first manifesto and the second one. Um, and one of the things I was going to say, there was a quote um, that said, like, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves, um, and then you guys are also talking about, like, military power, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and so I feel like there was a huge shift in just, like, um, uh, the, just the idea that we, we could all be just blown to smithereens with this technology, you know. To go off what Michael was saying, there's another great quote that's, God doesn't exist in modern society, mean like we have almost moved past the, the need for a god in order to uh because like a lot of original religions were used group people together and like form groups and we uh, like under capitalism have a different group to go with like the middle class or the lower class stuff like that but i think that in some morality sense like religion's always going to be there and it's always going to be a backbone of a lot of people so it's hard, I don't know, it's hard for me to reconcile that the religion's always going to be there, but it also people use it to base all morals off of, because I don't necessarily think that you need a religion to be morally correct. Well, just like off of what y'all two have said, it also, um, how there's no deity and they're going away from, you know, traditional religion, but like, this is during the Cold War, and a lot of the, like, iconic figures of the Cold War were viewed as deities, I feel like. So, in a way, they're, you know, people were turning away from, like, traditional Catholicism or stuff like that, yet they were staring at, like, you know, um, Stalin or Ho Chi Minh um, or Kim Il-sung as somebody, like, holier than man, even though they weren't. So, it just kind of then like like michael said there's just so much uneasiness like we kind of don't need a deity but also if we don't have like god then we need stalin or ho chi Minh or the u.s president someone to believe in right that's what the corliss lamont said people have to have some sense of meaning and purpose right so that's why you know you should try to figure out what your sense of meaning and purpose is um, because otherwise there's a lot of uh, charlatans out there. There's a lot of mistakes people make when they're seeking. Go ahead, Alexis. I, I'm not saying she's wrong, but I also think that a lot of people don't need a person or like an authority figure to stand behind. Personally, I don't stand behind the US government. I don't, when the US says we're going to war, I'm all down to go to war and put on my Navy boots and get on that and grab a gun. I'm, I'm, I think that's the me being from Germany and calling Germany my homeland and my land. That could be the whole thing. But I also think that people can stand behind a cause and fight those figures and be like, I am removing myself I might have misunderstood what y'all were trying to say, but I do think that they- And that would be based on reason, would you say? That would be based on arguments? It would be based on arguments, morals, and how a person thinks. Okay. Um, I don't think that there's like ever any, any big cause that doesn't have like 
like a, a leader of some sort. Um, you like uh, big causes, you don't really get things like accomplished without some organization uh, or else you just divulge into chaos. I mean, do you remember that group Anonymous whose whole thing is that they can never be caught because there's no leader. Um, so there's no one person to blame. It's kind of like the idea of Spartacus. So, and they sparked, like, whenever they leaked things, it sparked a big thing because obviously things were being kept from the public. But I think, like, what you, you were saying, I don't think people necessarily need to have someone. Is it not anonymous? Yeah. Sorry, I thought they, had, they had an they had a they had a mask that like a common mask they all wore. They all just like they all wore a gray hoodie yeah. and a mask that they shipped out to the members, and they all used the same filter, so it made the voice sound the same. And they were called an and they had like the same background. It's the same plain background with like LED lights above it. Yeah, they were called an on. So no one, so no one be like the leader had no one get too much power. It's kind of like that idea. Um, but I also see what Michael is talking about every almost every single movement has had someone to lead the front, so to speak. And I, I think that people, most, the majority of people need someone to follow. So a lot of people aren't leaders. They, I mean, I'm not saying like everyone should be a follower, but it, that seems to be the logic because you can't all be leaders. Yeah, and like, that makes me think, Jordan, of what Dr. Beck said earlier about like um if americans like can or can't um expect other citizens to like be productive or something like that because like um when i'm losing my train of thought i'm trying to remember it like if anything i feel like everyone now either expects um too much out of like americans or just people in general or too little like we've lost that middle ground like it's obvious that we need a leader but then at the same time um we don't like the leaders we have so then some just turn stagnant and I'm kind of losing my train of thought but it just it, it all kind of tied back to that in my mind how about where Socrates is an engaged citizen and he just always asking you to examine and re-examine right so constantly be deliberating with yourself or other people about well how are we going to deal with this and how are we going to deal with that um does that make sense to people yeah tim okay go ahead tim well, i was gonna say going off of what they said what happens is like most of the time you need read the reason why you need a leader because most of the time, nobody's gonna really step forward and and be like the head of it. Like everybody could think the same thing, but nobody like wants to be the person to really take action upon it. So that's that's why really why some things you need a leader and some things you don't. Because without like without somebody to just um to act upon a certain situation, it probably won't even happen or won't have the right um steps towards it. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, I think, I mean, this is kind of like corny. I mean, it's not corny, but like, I don't know. I always think about like Katniss Everdeen and like the Hunger Games. Oof, I get chills every time I watch that. I watch it like four times. Anyways, it's like the people all knew that they were being like treated wrong. Like they all knew it, but they needed a symbol and they needed a person to rally around. And that person that they could rally around like they put their hope in her and they put their hope in that person like for example like Mar Mar <laughs> I can't say Martin Luther um you know people put their hope in him and he like led the pack and so I feel like it's just like humans need kind of a symbol to rally around and also like everybody said like it takes a lot of strength to be that leader and to really Put everything out there and dedicate your life to it but I think like we as humans like we see and we, we see models not not physical models but we see things and it leads us and we kind of need something to follow and 
I think that's why religion plays a huge part in a lot of people's lives. Like, at least for me, like I try to model after what God wants and to live a godly life. And, you know, I use him as a model and I feel like that's why, um, you know, people grad- gravitate towards religion. And, you know, that's just what I think for that. Well, what would Jesus or what would God think of participating in the environmental movement? I mean, do you think we should participate in? I think so, in my opinion. I mean, God created the world, God created nature. And even though man was supposed to rule over nature and, you know, that was at a, you know, he made the world for us, in my opinion. Um like that doesn't mean we should destroy the world That's like, right. God to destroy what he created for us it's a gift and so even and I think when people say that we should have I mean I've heard the argument that people said that we should have like a bunch of like cow slaughtering places and that's totally fine it should be unethical that's totally fine because God said uh we should rule over the beasts and stuff like they put like a quote and I was like <laughs> okay that's a definition of manipulate i mean like he did say that but not in that type of sense like he's not saying destroy the world and be cruel about it you know like if you need to eat an animal you we need to you know do a little bit of fossil fuels to for planes and stuff i get that but that doesn't mean destroy the world and not think twice about what he created like god created the world piece by piece and so that's just how i feel about that i don't want to talk over you you can finish talking i just I know what you're talking about. Like I saw that and it's like, and there was a show, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name, but it was like one of those like fictional shows where man wasn't the leader anymore. And we were, uh, I think it was like vampires. We were getting fed off vampires and they had us like cattle. We have to think about it like that. How would we want, if we weren't at the top of the food chain, how would we want them to treat us? Personally, I would like them to get what they need and then call it a day and not kill me like get what you need if you need a little bit get some then leave me alone but like if we go around like we're supposed to rule this with grace we're supposed to we're supposed to treat it with care we're supposed to love the earth and treat it as our equal but then remember that in the whole state of the whole thing I can't I don't know if that was that show um I but I think so but um, the whole point is that they're there for us to provide for us, but we're also coexisting with them and we have to let them coexist with us. So why I, there, okay. I think Ryan made a good point earlier, like, different topic, but like whenever you talked about Katniss Everdeen, about reluctant leaders make oftentimes the best leaders because they don't feel the need to coalesce all the power within themselves. I think if people are so ready to step up to a leadership position simply to get power, that's where we see a lot of issues. And especially in big governments, like we look at Putin, for example, uh, you know, it just absolute power corrupts absolutely is a common saying, but it's mostly true in today's society, I think. Because you have to think about it, because when Katniss Everdeen realized, I can't remember what her name was, but the female Snow, she was so ready to become president that Katniss was like, yeah, no, you're gone. You're bye. But because like she realized how corrupt that girl was, I think it was after her sister got killed. Yeah, because it's fascism. She was like so it's showing fascism talk. coming back after. Oh my god! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> he said, <laughs> "But like that's the thing. When someone is so ready to take power. They're ready to use it and use it and put themselves first." And they want their viewpoints and how and like their viewpoints and how they see the world and how they think it should be to go out there. And they're not thinking about the common person, like how Katniss was, where she was struggling to get food. No, that female snow was in a bunker getting fed steak. Like it's not the same. So it reminds me of George Washington a little bit, you know, like George Washington was like, don't make me president, please don't make me president. But they kept doing it because they were like, well, it's because we think you're going to be a good job. And also that you don't want it because everyone wants it, but you don't. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let's, let's go. But humanists really do try to get away from worshiping a person, right? They keep trying to write a formula, an argument, because they know the dangers of mass 
movements, right? Run by, if you have a figure, an iconic figure, they might start out wanting to rule for the sake of the ruled, but it's so easy to become corrupt because people have trusted, right? They trust them too much. So you can trust a ruler too much or too little. Um, but let's go to let's go to the 2000 manifesto. Um, all right. So question is, do humanists promote Aristotelian way of life? Is that paganism or is that Christianity or is that America or what the heck is that? So what's the comparison there? And then um, let's go here. OK, so we had the summary of the manifestos. And then we had um, ah, secular humanism, a new planetary humanism. OK, you guys. This should make sense that the next wave would be, we've got to think of the planet, right? And so what do they say? They say humanism is blah, blah. It traces back its origin to Greece, Rome, China, um, India. Um, so it is much more internationally oriented. Um, artists, scientists, thinkers have been going for millennia, right? There were always humanists. And um, so they're scientific naturalists and they, um, okay, most worldviews accepted today, this is important, are spiritual, mystic, theological. They have their origins in ancient pre-urban nomadic and agricultural societies of the past, um, not the modern industrial, post-industrial global information culture, right? Scientific naturalism enables people to construct a coherent worldview disentangled from metaphysics or theology and based on the sciences. The benefits of the sciences, the realization um, there are ethical values are important too, but the growth of scientific knowledge will enable humans to make wiser choices. Um, a commitment to humanity and a planetary bill of rights. So now we have to worry about universal declaration. We have to worry about the rights of everybody. We have to have a global agenda. Um, we need new planetary institutions like the United Nations, the Geneva Conventions, NATO, but all sorts of like the laws of the sea. And they end up um, optimistic. Here's a summary of, um, this is human manifesto number three, and it's much shorter than the others. And this is um, an essay by one of the signers about the long range in impact. And he's still proud of himself for writing it. But then he talks a little bit about the people who have criticized it and some of the criticisms, which he disagrees with. Um, and so, um, yeah, okay. So one of the criticisms, um, his cry, warning cry to Christian that humanists intend to bring about a one world socialistic anti-God society, okay? Now, I don't know if any of you have heard, heard rhetoric like that. I mean, there is a lot of rhetoric like that out there. Um, you know, <clears throat> the humanists wanna make us all like, like Europe and Europe is degenerate because it's humanism and they want to take over the public schools. And this whole, the whole thing about critical race theory, the latest uh, alarm bell about the schools are trying to teach us, you know, all this stuff about race and making my children feel guilty or coming in there with their brainwashing. The 1619 project, I, you know, to me, this latest move is just there's a whole history behind that of being anti-humanist and if and to me the public schools they have to base their education on humanism because the students come from all these different backgrounds so you have to find this common ground so aristotle's virtues or the humanist tradition is the only way that you can actually educate kids for 
a worldview that will touch each of them and, tr and have the golden rule be based on the golden rule. You can treat them equally because as a matter of fact, they're equal, right? It's not just something you're mandated. The teacher should believe in that, right? That every kid has equal humanity. It doesn't matter if they were raised in an atheist household, Buddhist household, fundamentalist Christian household, liberal Christian, doesn't matter. And so the schools have to be based on humanism, um, but that's a criticism, right? Then the Quakers, um, and the Quakers emphasize the golden rule. Uh, so what I wanna get at is this one. All right, so I wanna get at this and, <clears throat> And it doesn't mean that all criticism of humanism are like this. I'm just giving you a sense there are some like this, right? That humanism is the original sin of Adam, where human beings are making themselves like God. It was a declaration of autonomy from God. And so that's what humanism is. It's that original sin. Um, they're calling for a man-made utopia. They reject God. They embrace the state. They look to bureaucratic institutions like education, uh, the rule of law, um, to redeem man from his self-destructive ways, right? So yeah, they look to they look to science and to institutions to, to initiate the science to make us a sustainable society right? They look to political science and look at all the data in order to create a middle class. They do that. They, they do that as political leaders, as professors, as teachers, even if they might be Christian. When they're working in the public realm, yeah, they do base things on humanism. Is that original sin? Um, is it that we cannot possibly redeem ourselves except through Jesus? Well, then what, right? Then we've got problems in our country because we have a whole lot of citizens that, that don't agree with that. Um, cultural sewage from our media and entertainment industries, blah, blah. So that's the humanist's fault. Um, all right, so let's see. I'm going to make all of you, you know, react to this. And he has read all these documents. Um, really, it's not that he hasn't read them. He's read them, and he quotes from them. And he just thinks that this is original sin. This is horrible. Stay away from it. Don't touch it. You'll go to hell if you have anything to do with the humanists, right? Um, Let's see, and and there, uh, you know, you could call them liberal elites. It's those pointy-headed elites, those people who think they're better than us, those people who look down on us because they're so smart. But no, they're actually the ultimate sinners. Um, let's see, um, and then he quotes one person who claims he wants to build an artificial sun, and of course. Most humanists don't think that, right? He and maybe this guy and two other people would think that, but that's hardly a characterization of humanism. But you could say that Bill Gates is the contemporary version. He really is trying to figure out how to create a, a way to, to suck carbon out of the air because of the data. So he thinks we have to take really uh, extreme measures because we're really heading toward destruction. So, I mean, wh what do you say? Like somebody, an anti-humanist would say, yeah, he's the epitome of the antichrist. We're not gonna do anything like that. Or do you say he didn't want, you know, he doesn't want us to have to do this, but he does want to preserve life on earth. Um, and you've got to use engineering and you've got to use your brain. Um, all right, let's see. Oh yeah, they promote themselves as the brains of the human race, right? And that's true, they do. There is There are a group of high techies 
that just really are working out technological solutions and they can't figure out how to persuade people who are irrational and they're driven by all these false um, anti-scientific point of view. Um, Christians should not be cowed by these sophomoric um, intellectuals. Okay, all right, so everybody has to clock in. And I wanna give, everybody has to say one thing that they can understand why the person said that, that it might be partly right. All right, before you go and start saying whatever you want to say. Okay, I'm going to start with Tim. What do you think? Well, um, wait, can you rephrase the question again? Well, I mean, I, okay. So I'll call on somebody else, but I mean, I just said, you know, there's the anti-humanists, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is your reaction to that? Just which of those things stood out to you as the guy, the guy is right or the guy is wrong or, you know, what? <laughs> well, um, oh, um, I mean, uh, that's, that's what they think though. So if, I mean, that's what you think. That's what you think, but. I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's just, if that's what they think, that's them. Okay, but then they vote on the basis of that because they're bringing their religion into government. And now they're voting against, they elect legislators that say climate change is a hoax, right? So we do, we do have legislators that are anti-science, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, what are we going to do about that? Well, hopefully we can change them out for somebody else if, they, if they're doing that, because climate change is definitely not a hope. It's, it's, it's real. It really can change stuff. Not good. So, I mean, I, I, I want to say have everybody thinking the same thing, but because it's good to be diverse, but I mean, I would just sub in a few people who at least have similar ideas. When it comes to science, there isn't as much, you know, uh, wiggle room, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can disagree about how to get Putin to stop bombing Iraq, uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. because he's a human being. And, you know, you'll try sanctions and you'll try this and you'll try that. But with the natural world, it's kind of like, you can't say, oh, the natural world really isn't falling apart uh, when all the data says, well, yes, it is. Did you look at any of the films? Have you ever been there? Have you ever read data about the extreme? You know, that's kind of a different thing than a human being. It's not as, you know, nature doesn't change just because we decided to make a deal. <laughs> If I was Putin's mom, he wouldn't invade. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right. So did you not see that? This woman made like a whole poetry slam about if she was Putin's mom, Putin wouldn't invade Ukraine. Like it was an insane, it's that notion, I think, that like you can change people. But, but what was Tim was saying, I think that uh, a lot of people inflate what they think are facts but are actually opinions so like people's opinion that like climate change is real that's climate change is real that's a fact it's a plain fact that people want to act like it's an opinion that it's real things like that my mom I showed her that post I was like mom what do you, I literally went up to her and I was like mom what do you think about this and she was like she read it and she was like oh yeah mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. if I had raised Putin and her exact words were, if I had raised Putin, I'm doing her accent. If I had raised Putin, I swear to you and I swear to Jesus, he'd be, if he even thought about invading Ukraine, he'd be down on his knees praying to Jesus for forgiveness before I handle him. And I was like, mother, I'm living for it. 
And then she said, if you ever try something like that, I don't care if you go to Congress, the presidency, if you ever, ever try something stupid like that, I swear I will take off my left shoe, take off my right shoe. You can run, but this left shoe will hit you before this right shoe does. And I was like, I was like, yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, there are a lot of moms who do encourage their sons to be authoritarian, actually. So you have to remember that too. Well, my mom encourages me. She like if I became president, she'd be the most proud person ever. But if I did something like right hurt innocent people because I want that land, she'd be like, you couldn't have done that any other way. You couldn't have won those people over. But there are moms who would think it was okay, right? Yeah. Um, But let's get back to the let's get back to the anti-humanism thing because I I want you all to just face it, address it, read it, think about it, assimilate it. And a lot of you probably know a lot more about it than I do, but I absolutely really want you to know that this is the disagreement because it is a major factor behind polarization. And that's gonna be a major factor in your life in terms of whether our democracy can survive and whether we take care of the earth. So that's why I want to make sure everybody clocks in about this. You can't write it off or ignore it uh, just because it's not pleasant. Uh, It's a very real thing to address if you want to be an engaged citizen in the United States. So Colin, what do you think? What did you think when you read that? Um, one of the things that I did actually like, I just lost it where to go, um, where he was like, yeah, uh, the manifesto, okay, whatever. But he's like, but they have all these signatures. There it is. All these supporting signatures by like these A-list interrupt, like intellectual people, um, as like, yay, the smartest people are with us is like what he said. I kind of agree with that idea because it doesn't like that helps with the common person to look at it because if someone isn't uh, taught to question society and question things um, it you'll just take it as the word of it being a fact there's a chemistry thing that's out there I'm blanking on it, but it keeps being like brought up because it's pretty much like a fake research paper that's people start to like actually cite and believe in. But if you actually read it word for word and what it is and like question a couple of things, you clearly see it that it's not real, it's fake. Yeah, there is problems with um, uh, scientific research in university, some of it has been called out. So uh, any discipline can make a mistake. Um, But they, I mean, I hope you would understand that um, people are offended by liberal elites that look down on them. And to me, that's legit. Like, if you really want democracy, you just start out asking a person, well, what's, you know, What's your ultimate thing? And I'll agree with them. These people are arrogant. I can even tell you, I can, boy, do I know about arrogance? I'm a philosophy prof. I could give them way more data than they even know about this kind of arrogance and this kind of arrogance. And I mean, I had to deal with this SOB philosophy prof and I had to deal with this, you know? So I understand that, I really do. And then the question is, does nature benefit from this arrogance? We're talking about nature. We're not talking about a bunch of emotionally uh, challenged smart people, okay? Um, So I I can understand that. Um, Another thing is a member of the Ku Klux Klan, somebody asked him, well, why did you join? He said, it's not a hate group. I joined because I want a better world for my children. So how do you convince that person that being more inclusive would be a better world for their children? That's what you need to convince them of, right? 
and you really need to think about it, how to convince them. And I do think, you know, the, the all boats shall rise. If you let in immigrants, there's more jobs. And then they do more of the, they start out doing the field work and, but they need teachers and they need contractors to build houses. And so if you have a job higher on the food chain, you'll get more, you know, work. As long as these people are made citizens, they're paying taxes and all this stuff. So, I mean, there's an argument for it. It's just that you have to start where the person is at. But anyway, I want to, um, Aaron, what from that conversation or that list of criticisms, what stuck out to you? I don't know if my mic's working. Um, what stuck out to me was, like it talks about it, like humanism turning into like, it talks about the court case about humanism becoming or being declared a religion. And like, that is becoming like an increasingly like, um, like it's increasingly like common, like, I guess, rebuttal to like the cancel culture and like the, the woke movement in quotation marks or whatever. And like, I mean, I think that's like probably one of the biggest issues I think it kind of needs to be addressed is because like how do you make it not become like one person gets all the say and everyone just follows because we're kind of seeing that kind of take place in today's society as well yeah I actually I don't even know what cancel counselor or woke is even though I hear about it a lot um, but I I just from what I hear about it it's emotionally immature and it distracts from trying to give every human being a chance to flourish. Is that true, Aaron? Would you say it's just distracting from what we really want to do? Oh, I was going to say the cancel culture thing he was talking about. It's basically where our culture now is like, like kind of, um, um, then oh, I don't know the word for it, but they're looking down upon people who say something outlandish that's not part of the norm, and they're like condescending. Yeah, yeah, okay. basically shunning them, and it's like it's kind of stupid because you could be basically saying if you like this class, if I, if we could all cancel you, you could still do exactly what you do every day. It doesn't really cancel you. It's just it's just a term people get offended by but if you are one of those people who don't really care what other people think then it's nothing to you but for people who care about what other people think it's like such a big thing for no reason yeah, yeah. i think yeah sorry uh, i think it's like pushing those people away like you could bring those people in with you if you would just listen to them and hear what they say instead of being like oh you said a bad thing and kind of just pushing them away because then you give them no chance to come back in you're basically shunning them from the society you want to create. Right. I think it's a lot of reactionary politics. Um, people want to be right all the time. I also think that the rhetoric that we do need to listen to these people who have hateful ideas is also wrong because I'm not like here to educate people. I think that's part of another thing about like liberalism is that I was like, well, you don't know anything. You don't know this. It's not my job to educate people. It's their job to branch out as human beings. I also understand that logic that if you want to have like peace between us, but I honestly, a lot of these people are so hateful. I don't really care if they get on my side or not. Like, that's just kind of how I feel. Whether right or wrong. Somebody else who hasn't spoken, Zane, so you can't, your microphone doesn't work, Zane. That's too bad because I really like what you say. But anyway, okay, Ryan. Oh, um, just on that, I mean, similar to kind of like religion, like I feel like everybody has, I mean, even if somebody says something super outrageous, super crazy, like how could they say that? I feel like all people are kind of in some way valid in some point not not all the time but i'm just saying most of the time like even if you disagree with somebody they're valid in some point so if you keep having that open dialogue at one point you will find some type of overlap some type of agreement if even if it stems off from the original viewpoint 
you know, like it just depends. Like, I mean, some like harder ones would obviously be like people who's totally against like gay marriage. You know, you keep having that dialogue, like even though you sound like that's completely crazy, like why is it any of your concern whether somebody gets married? Like that's my viewpoint. <laughs> So even as a Christian, I mean, that's not my point to tell somebody else that they can't do something, but you keep having that dialogue at one point, you will find it. So I feel like that's why I don't believe in cancer, cancer, cancel culture, (laughs) because I just feel like, I mean, obviously, like for me, sometimes I feel like I want to go on social media and be a social media influencer just so people can try and cancel me because you won't, (laughs) you know, I'll still have my opinion regardless. So I feel like kind of what I think Tim said, like, regardless of if you get canceled or not, like, you're still going to have those viewpoints, like, you know, and it doesn't, I mean, I guess it kind of doesn't really matter. So yeah. well, for the, the gay thing, for example, can't you just ask, well, do you really want them not to be able to get a job at all? And so they're on the street, right? Or do you really want them not to be able to get a house or an apartment? Because um, that's all, you know, it's the government should give them a right you know, you don't discriminate in jobs and housing. That's all, you know, that's all the political issue is. Like, you can think anything about. Yeah, for sure. And like, kind of just relating back to like, the last couple of weeks, like, it's all about balance. And kind of, like, even earlier today, we talked about like, uh, the deity thing, like, I don't believe in deity, I believe in myself. Like, I think it's all about balance. And in society, we're always creating a black and white, and it's not black and white. Like, you know, there's always some gray. And I feel like in a lot of points, like there's great. Another thing I think you can appeal to is if you say, well, I think there's a lot of of money behind this and there are rich folk that are getting rich off of having people doubt climate change. So, you know, that's just a, right. That's a, an opener, right. And you can give some examples. There's a whole history of corporations literally selling doubt like a like a product and so there's a history of that so that that oftentimes can be a bridge builder right that it's not an identity thing i'm a pro green and i'm an anti green it's just about who's making the money <laughs> and you know that often can help does that make sense to people um, Arkansans used to vote Democrat. They didn't trust those rich guys at the top. Uh, and they, you know, they were right. <laughs> but the rich guys at the top figured out how to create a whole political campaign that would distract from the fact that they're getting exploited. And that would be God, guns, gays, abortion, right? I am so sorry. I meant to send that to my soccer group chat. I am so sorry. That's about the, my, my teammates. I am so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Hey. Um, anyway, so, all right. So I want to make sure everybody has spoken. Has everybody spoken about anti-humanism? Alyssa? Um, I hadn't yet. Okay. Um, the thing that I, that um, he argued that I thought made perfect sense to me was how like humanism kind of goes back to original sin how you know they're looking in the face of god and like declaring themselves as equals and i see where they say where he would say that and it does make some sense to me because we see when people um you know think they're holier than thou the like harm they can cause um but at the same time you know that doesn't mean necessarily that we aren't going and questioning authority figures. Um, I think that's something he kind of overlooks. Like we need to be able to question like God or political leaders or anyone um, uh, in, author- in an uh, authoritative state. But um, just mainly that part like stuck to me about original sin. Cause I like, I completely got what he was talking about, about how, um, you know, they think that they have the ability to act as those ways. Um, and it kind of made me think of the um, the people that want power just to have the power and versus like reluctant leaders. Well, Jesus questioned the religious authorities, right? So, you know, Jesus was 
a revolutionary or he held power accountable, right? Right. So that's a good thing to do. If you're a Christian, you should hold your religious leaders accountable. Some of them are corrupt. You should hold your political leaders accountable. Some of them are corrupt. And you can't have a democracy unless you can make a distinction between the ones, a good distinction, right? Between the ones that are really just motivated and they're exploiting you and the ones that are trying to do something. Okay, so for next time, uh, you, let's see, is it for next time or the time? Oh no, let's see. Next time is Martin Luther King because I didn't get to it today. And then he's a humanist. So, and then Christian humanism, uh, humanist psychology, humanism and racism, and, um, oh, okay. And where was that? Okay. The um, list of different kinds of humanism. You have to go find your own kind, your favorite kind of humanism, just so, you know, if somebody says, I, I don't like humanists, well, you say, well, which kind? <laughs> There's humanist psychology. I have an article for you to read. Humanism and politics, Christian humanism, use of the arts, abortion, rational life, environmentalism, um, polytheism, all this stuff. We have, there's African-American humanism. There's humanism and feminism. And these are just lists of, from the, what the students sent me, uh, what I've read over the years. But each of you needs to find your own and you do need to bring um, uh, you know, a presentation of some sort, like a paragraph that you've written about this. Um, and then this is the, what happened after 9-11 is when it got pretty bad. I really believe the pagans, and that's Aristotle's a pagan, you know, the abortionists, the feminists, the gays, you helped this happen. It was because our country was getting taken over that God allowed it to happen. God didn't cause it. You're not supposed to be nice, the Episcopalians. Well, 85 of them signed the Declaration of Independence. And the thing about women, um, we want to be a Christian nation. So that would be uniting church and state. And that was not what our founders wanted. They wanted to be a nation based on law that also has Christians. But which, you comes, which comes first is matters a lot. Then there's the Christian right. And they are um, very pro-free enterprise, really. They're anti-regulation on capital on capitalism and they're pretty radical. They did not want uh, the banks to be propped up during the economic collapse. Well, I mean, there's arguments there, but we, uh, in general, if we'd done nothing, we would have fallen into a depression. That's pretty, pretty obvious, but somehow that would be okay. That'd be better than having the government intervene. Um, and it, there should be an absolute principle, like the government never intervenes. And if we don't stick with this pro-capitalist, pro-Christian, pro-family thing, we're going to fall into that abyss of socialism in Europe, where they have preschool, they pay all these taxes, and then they have these preschools and schools and free college and public transportation and healthcare and all this awful socialist stuff. It's terrible. It goes against God because it's trying to play God. Okay. Then you have Pope Francis and he would be a Christian humanist. He rejects bigotry. He rejects partisanship. Um, he's, he thinks we should assimilate immigrants. We rejects might makes right. So all of this stuff is very humanistic. Um, and then here's public policy. There's so many public policies that they, they come to loggerheads on, right? Prayer in the schools, um, allowing government funding to fund uh, uh, religious-based schools during COVID. 
when um, schools, public schools were getting COVID funding, Betsy DeVos. So the head of the Department of Education was, okay, if you're gonna have a head of the Department of Education, what kind of person should that be? Should it be somebody who was poor, middle-class, lower-class and went to public schools? How many of you think it should be somebody who has experience in the public schools should be the head of the Department of Education? All right, well, the person who was appointed was a billionaire uh, who went to all Christian, private Christian schools. So what would she know, right? And she already had an ideology that the public schools are crap. And so she tried to, you know, she tries to get charter schools to replace them and stuff. So, all right, so there's big controversies about that. How much public funding should go to promote Christian schools or charter schools where you can be a Christian charter school, you can be whatever you want. Um, all right, character building. Is that, you know, socialism? Is that that brainwashing that the humanists want to do? Your character building should be done in church, not at school. Uh, there is a social emotional development curriculum. They're against that. Um, charitable giving. So, um, so charitable giving doesn't solve the problems of how to give people education and healthcare and transportation, right? Um, but it promotes religion, charities. You, so you have ta tax breaks for giving to religious-based organizations as opposed to um, the humanists would give to organizations that are like using science to help literally lift people up. And the religious ones are just promoting prayer and, you know, the church. The church is the character builder. Um, tax breaks for churches. What about these laws, right? Abortion, guns, euthanasia, capital punishment, military versus diplomacy, environmental protection, government funding programs for human well being, um, how to prevent crime, how to have um, neighborhood policing, how to, you know, help lift up the poor. Um, is wealth caused by virtue? right? And you shouldn't steal people's money by taxing rich people. What about refugee resettlement? Um, okay, women's equality. Do you have to factor in that they're an oppressed group? Um, what about international affairs? Um, should we negotiate with other countries? Or should we, you know, boss them around? Um, what about economic trade? Should we work with them or should we just compete against them? What about the United Nations? Should we pay attention to it? Um, the Geneva Conventions, um, environmental laws, should we comply with them or not? Should we, you know, cooperate or compete with other countries because they're not Christian, they're socialist or whatever? Um, what do you need to know to be a good citizen? And um, all right. So um, anybody else want to comment on the what happened after 9-11 and this much bigger divide between humanists and anti-humanists? Nobody wants, to, how many of you are aware of that, that it just sort of went on, got on steroids? Because, you know, you weren't born, so you wouldn't know. So you're basically born into an environment that is a lot more polarized than I was born into. So I, I watched it, right, from a distance. Um, I know that the country doesn't need to be that way. And I really hope that it will move forward in a better direction. Um, let's see, any other things? Okay, so for next time, I really do, you, you need to tell me in your posts how much time you're spending, whether you're reading the stuff, how much of the stuff you're reading, 
and I do want you to go back and on every post sort of give me give me the truth um, because I told you you know you're not going to be able to do everything but there's days when I think did you do anything and again you might have to wait till the weekend and play catch up but I just want an honest answer you know an honest description of what you actually got to so Martin Luther King is definitely a Christian humanist he's definitely in the Western tradition he's very conservative in his basic principles um okay and I do want you to read about uh, Christian humanism, humanist psychology. So you can eyeball it, you have to read every page, but it's just of interest. It's something for you to sort of know about. Um, so those are the things, and this will be our last day uh, on humanism, the 13th Wednesday. All uh -huh. right, go ahead. Questions? Just to be clear, you want us to do readings from both of those? You want us to? Yeah. Okay. Because it has the same date on it. And that's why in the summertime, we just don't have nearly as many class periods, right? So I had to put them together. Um, any other questions? Okay, does anybody wanna stay after class for office hours? Just let me know, Colin, okay. Cause I can always stay after. Um, <clears throat> I might go grab something to eat, Colin. <laughs> but other than that, okay, you guys, I um I enjoyed talking to you and I hope.